that I'm now a professor of applied linguistics, technical communication at Merseburg University of Applied Sciences. This is a small university in the middle of Germany. Uh, I teach courses in text production, but also usability and things like that in our technical communication programs. And before rejoining university, I worked as a tech writer for 12 years in a software company selling a large enterprise e-commerce platform. Uh, I managed the docs team, but I was also involved hands-on in, in planning and creating, maintaining manuals, online hub systems, and other types of uh, software documentation. So unlike many other speakers here, documenting, promoting, managing APIs is not part of my daily business anymore. And also, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a trained linguist. And I'm discussing APIs more from an applied research perspective. And I will take a few minutes uh, soon to let you know what type of research I think could be relevant. The work reported here was part of a project that explored ways to make API docs more useful and effective. Mm, the talk will present some guidelines that we developed to make API docs, the API docs better fit information needs and expectation of developers. And I will then present the results of an empirical test uh, that we conducted to demonstrate that those guidelines indeed improve uh, developer performance. Um, please note that the work presented here was done jointly um, with my collaborators, Stefanie Steinhardt and Andreas Schubert. So before Diving into the topic of API docs, let me briefly explain my approach to research in technical documentation. So the type of research I personally find relevant and interesting. Perhaps due to my practical background in tech writing, my approach to research is also practical in a way. Um, I'm most interested in questions that are motivated by problems tech writers face in their work and questions that generate a practitioner's takeaway and can inform decisions that tech writers have to make in their work. Um, I have experienced over and over again that tech writers are faced constantly with numerous decisions uh, when working on a manual API reference or some other information product. And there's two main decisions that are in the focus of my concern, namely which information, which content should we present to the user? What is the information need? And if we have decided on the information to present, then a second question is, how should we present that information in order to support our audience best? Um, that's a seemingly easy question, but uh, it's pretty clear that answers to these questions depend on many factors, such as assumptions about user goals, the tasks they want to solve, and knowledge they bring to the task. But even if these issues are somehow resolved, we're still left with uh, more than one option in, in most cases. And we often see that under the same set of assumptions, the decisions that tech writers then make can differ greatly. And this point is illustrated neatly, I think, by the example on the slide here. Um, is that better? <laughs> So I hope this is a little better. Um, I made it bigger. Um, so what you see here is um, uh, excerpts from um, the Adobe FrameMaker manual uh, in two versions, Adobe FrameMaker 8 and Adobe FrameMaker 11, uh, brief sections that differ with the same use case, namely adding files to a, a FrameMaker book. Um, the section on the left is from FrameMaker 11, and the section on the right is from FrameMaker 8. So assumptions about the FrameMaker users and the knowledge they bring to the tasks should be fairly similar, right? But still, the results look very different, both with respect to the information presented to the user and how this information is presented. So whereas the FrameMaker 11 version on the left takes a rather minimalist approach, sticks to a description of the goal, Action, action steps to reach that goal. The FrameMaker 8 version on the right also contains a longer paragraph following the main heading that describes the goal in more detail and provides conceptual background information on FrameMaker books. And moreover, some information 
is presented using a screenshot which is missing in the FrameMaker 11 version on the left. So my research is often driven by the question, does it make a difference which way I go in situations like this? Sure, it makes a difference in terms of cost, but does it make a difference from a user perspective? So in this case, would users actually read the extended goal description and the conceptual information? Would they look at the screenshot? And would all this make them more successful? I'm convinced that answers are not trivial and that we need research that helps technical communicators make informed decisions in situations like this. Um, management always wants tech writers to reduce cost, right? But if we can show that users benefit more from, say, option A than from option B, then we might be able to convince management to support option A, even if it is more expensive. So what type of research do we then need to address questions like this and what is available? On the one hand, this basic research, pure research, which aims at developing and validating theories and models, such as in linguistics and cognitive psychology. But this type of theory-driven pure research, it is important, but theories models often do not translate right away into criteria or recommendations that can drive the work of technical writers. And on the other hand, this usability testing, also an active area of research, very informative. However, however usability testing typically remains at the individual product level. The goal of usability testing is to identify specific trouble spots of a specific product. This is valuable to improve this particular product. However, results can be difficult to generalize. My own focus is on applied research. Um, applied research studies the effect of design variables on user behavior, such as just including a screenshot or a detailed goal description make users more successful. Um, applied research in this sense is aimed at principles that can guide the work of practitioners, principles that are grounded in theory, but also generalizable and validated by empirical evidence. Um, this approach to research has a long history in technical communication, of course. An example which you probably are all familiar with is the minimalist approach to documentation advocated by John Carroll, Hans van der May, and others. And I believe that the success of minimalism is not simply due to the fact that it intuitively makes sense. Um, minimalism provides principles of information design that have a very practical implications that are generalizable and very importantly that have been validated by empirical studies demonstrating that users are more successful they learn faster they make fewer errors when using minimalist documentation right from the beginning in the 80s and i think this was a major factor um, that contributed to the success and this uh, wide adoption of uh, minimalism all right um, in our project we applied to a to uh, drag this approach to API documentation. Um, and there's two main reasons why we think this could be of value. First reason, API docs differ greatly regarding the information they present and the way they present that information to the user. The example here shows a snapshot of the documentation portal of the Ship Cloud API. This is a simple, very powerful REST API that helps online shops connect to shipping providers. And the ShipCloud docs portal takes a rather classical approach. It offers an API reference, additional examples using a problem solution structure, a section explaining important concepts. The descriptions are minimalist and uh, text and code examples are presented in a single column. Now, it's not difficult to find portals that use a different approach, such as Twilio, shown here. The content is organized more consistently by topics and use cases. The descriptions provide more detail. Navigation is here now positioned on the left and not on the right-hand side, as with ShipCloud. And another difference is that text, paragraphs, code examples are presented in separate columns. So by looking at examples like this, it becomes evident that tech writers concerned with API docs also tend to arrive at very different solutions in response to similar problems. And similar to the Adobe Framework example, we see different answers to the question which information to present and how to present it. So research, I think, is called for 
could help to find out whether the differences matter, for example, using one or two columns, and to develop evidence-based principles that can drive the work of technical writers. Um, a second reason why we think that more research is necessary and could be of value is um, API docs um, simply seem to miss, in many cases, the information needs of developers. So it's a trivial observation that learning new APIs is part of the daily business of developers. And I think it's uncontroversial that some APIs are harder to learn than others, which is a fact that has drawn a lot of attention to API usability. In a landmark study on API documentation, uh, Martin Robillard and Robert Deline asked developers about factors that make learning an API hard. And several such factors emerged, such as problems with uh, the technical environment, problems with the API structure. But the factor that seems to be most critical is insufficient learning resources, such as documentation or code examples. And we ran a similar study. We conducted interviews with developers, and we ran a survey, and we asked developers to name problems that they often run into when learning a new API. And consistent with the Robillard and Deline findings, the problems mentioned most often are also related to documentation. So in our case, wrong or incomplete documentation or documentation that is difficult to comprehend. So studies like this suggest that with respect to API docs, there's a lot of room for improvement. We aren't there yet, and we need a better understanding of the real information needs of developers and how we can serve those needs best. Um, I believe that identifying and serving the information needs of developers is not a trivial issue, and things that experts would say work intuitively often do not seem to make sense and do not uh, seem to work. Sorry, for example, Stack Overflow, um, as you probably all know, attempted to build a documentation around extensive code examples using a problem solution structure, but apparently relying mainly on code examples uh, was not the right move. So Stack Overflow documentation did not find sufficient level of acceptance among developers and was closed after a pretty short uh, beta phase. Um, to sum up, I argued that getting into a new API is often a pretty hard task. And one main reason why it is hard is that resources to learn the API and API docs in particular often seem to miss the information needs of developers. Poor learning resources appear to be the main obstacle for learning APIs. Now, a lot of research has already addressed information needs of developers, tried to find out how they proceed when they learn a new API, start to use it, questions they raise, information they look for in the documentation, and different methods have been used in that research, such as interviews and surveys or lab studies have been conducted to explore how developers proceed and what they actually do when they start learning a new API, studies monitoring developer activities directly at the workplace in a real-world context, and, and also studies analyzing content uh, which developers produce themselves, for example, as part of open source projects where you can assume they produce just the content they would need uh, themselves. Um, and based on those findings, several guidelines have been proposed regarding content to present and dimensions of content design that would support developers locating and processing this content effectively. However, and that was kind of motivating our study, no attempts have been made so far to demonstrate that following those guidelines actually leads to better documentation in the sense that it better supports initial interaction with an API, makes interactions more efficient, more effective. So the main question we wanted to address with our empirical study was if we take the effort and if we follow the guidelines that have been proposed in the literature, is it worth the effort and do developers really benefit from that effort? Uh, so here's a few research findings that motivated the guidelines which we tested in our empirical study. Uh, that's, of course, not an exhaustive list, but just a few things that are um, particularly important with respect to our uh, guidelines. A finding that I consider particularly important is that developers use 
different strategies when starting to work with a new API. Uh, the different strategies have been described in work by Stephen Clark in terms of different developer personas. Uh, Clark distinguishes between opportunistic, pragmatic, and systematic developers. Um, opportunistic developers work in a more exploratory manner and the attempt to start working on specific tasks as soon as possible. And in contrast, systematic developers would try to understand how the API works before diving into the details of a task. Uh, they deal with concepts even if the concepts do not relate directly to the task at hand. Pragmatic developers combine elements of both strategies. It has also been shown that having background knowledge on the domain um, covered by the API facilitates learning and initial interaction a lot. So, for example, when the task is to interact with an API for procurement or order management, then background knowledge on e-commerce and some knowledge of standard business processes related to procurement or order management is very helpful. If the API is for gene sequencing, then of course developers would benefit from knowledge of how gene sequencing works. Research also showed that developers want to solve problems and not to learn an API as a whole, and hence the access documentation in a task-oriented manner. Code examples perhaps do not suffice on their own, but they play still a very important role in learning uh, as a starting point uh, for developing solutions to specific tasks. They are important as well because developers like to copy and paste and uh, use some example code as starting point for their own solution. And finally, a main challenge for developers is to find entry points into an API. So how to get started and how to map business objects to API elements. Um, from findings like this, as I mentioned, various guidelines for optimizing API docs have been derived. Our study looked at a specific set of guidelines, namely guidelines which we had proposed and motivated in earlier work. Uh, of course, there are many more proposals, for example, guidelines discussed in the Robillard and Deline study. Mm. We organized our guidelines in three groups, depending on the overall goal of the guidelines. And I will walk you briefly through this. Uh, one, offer, one overall goal is to enable efficient access to relevant content. Um, developers proceed in a strictly task-oriented manner, so it's a good idea to organize content by task or use cases addressed by the API. And moreover, there's evidence that developers tend to ignore documents that focus on concepts. So we propose to present important concepts in the immediate context of tasks or use cases where this knowledge is needed. Another Overall goal is to facilitate initial entry into an API, so helping to get started with the API and uh, to get started with implementing specific use cases. And important in this respect is to provide clean and complete code examples that are ready for copy and paste reuse. It's important to provide a concise overview of the API because this is the piece of information developers will look for first. And moreover, background knowledge on the domain covered by the API should be provided, such as say on order management or procurement, because as uh, research has shown, such knowledge facilitates the process of getting into a new API. The third and final block of guidelines um, is intended to support the different strategies that, that developers adopt for learning and programming. And in particular, I think API docs should make sure they also address the needs of developers that work in an exploratory and code-oriented way, so the opportunistic developer, for example, by using a layout that presents code examples in a separate column, by providing features that enable developers to get active as soon as possible, such as tryout function, or by using visual signaling or color coding to link code elements mentioned in the text to respective sections in a code example that complements the text. Mm -hmm. To illustrate how these guidelines could be implemented, they are rules of thumb and they can be implemented in different ways. Uh, but to illustrate how this could look like, we created documentation prototypes. We re-implemented the documentation of an existing API, the ShipCloud API referred to earlier. 
For that, we used a simple HTML-based site generator and then generated different versions of that documentation. Uh, the starting point was we have a non-optimized base version that sticked very close to the original ship cloud documentation. So what you see here is the starting page of the non-optimized version. I should also add a disclaimer, namely that this is, has not been reviewed by ship cloud. This has not been um, checked by ship cloud for errors and mistakes. So any error that might occur here on those slides showing prototypes uh, are our own. Okay, this is the starting page. And now let's look at the optimized version of the starting page. Uh, it's shown here. Um, so we reorganized content, we modified the content and the content design. And uh, this is the result specifically for the starting page shown here. We highlighted the API overview. We changed the organization of content and sections and subsections to make it more task oriented and to make it follow the kind of path that developers like to follow, like first understand overall what the API is about and what they can do. And then second, uh, understand how to interact with the API, technical requirements, how to set it up and how to issue API calls and so on, and then how to use the API. So how to implement specific use cases to get tasks solved. Um, we also added a code example that developers can use to get productive and active immediately. And we present that code example in a column of its own to, to facilitate uh, selective access to code. Here's a second example page um, from the non-optimized version. This section describes how return shipments are handled. And even if you are not into e-commerce and this API, there's a few things to notice immediately. For example, the example here contains several placeholders, which were probably used to reduce redundancies, right? But due to the placeholders, the example is not ready for copy and paste reuse anymore. Now, this is, again, the optimized version of the page. Uh, we reworked the code example and we replaced the placeholders with the respective sections that were needed. We added text and graphic to explain the concept of return shipment, which is important in the context of this use case. Um, and we added a graphic where we uh, tried also to link parameters like package and service to the business object return shipment and we used color coding uh, to support developers in identifying an important parameter mentioned in the verbal description in the code example i don't think i can show that here but this service parameter mentioned here is then highlighted here in the example all right now let's move on to the actual test um, our main question was would the guidelines that we had proposed in earlier work indeed enable more successful initial interaction, interactions uh, with the ship cloud API? And uh, once we can establish that uh, interactions are more successful, um, do the guidelines affect more like searching and processing information in the documentation? Or do they support perhaps planning and executing the task? Or do they perhaps support both? dimensions. And to address these research questions, we set up a test, a simple A-B test, which contrasted the performance of developers working with either non-optimized or optimized documentation. Um, we used the control version, the non-optimized version as baseline, and the optimized version as uh, treatment condition. Um, so using the ship cloud API, as already mentioned, we developed uh, five tasks that participants had to solve, such as creating a shipment and creating a return shipment, creating a shipment with a pickup at a specific date and time and location. Participants were free to use the documentation at any point they wanted, but uh, they were not specifically encouraged to do so. Um, we had 22 participants in the test, which we randomly assigned to one of two groups. Uh, group working with a non-optimized documentation and a group working with optimized documentation. We ran individual sessions with each participant in our lab or also on site at um, the companies that uh, sent um, 
uh, developers to participate in our test. Uh, we recorded audio and uh, video screencasts as well as participants' eye movements. And we also ran short pre and post test questionnaires. So uh, what, did we what did we find out? The mm, first variable we looked at to assess success on task was accuracy on tasks. Um, we found that the group working with optimized documentation solved more tasks correctly. Um, the difference is not huge numerically, but it is pretty robust uh, statistically. A uh, second variable we analyzed was the time participants needed to complete the tasks. As the diagram shows, the mean time per task was very similar across conditions with a slight but non-significant tendency for tasks to be solved faster if participants had access to optimized documentation. And to address the second research questions, question, we analyzed how much time our participants spent in the documentation and how much time they spent outside the documentation. So, for example, in the Postman client that we provided to them uh, to issue API calls and to analyze the responses. We use that categorization as an appro approximation to understand how much time participants invested in searching for and processing information in the API docs and the time they would need to prepare and actually execute the test tasks by for example, configuring and submitting an API call through Postman. As the bars on the right side show, participants working with optimized documentation spend less time in the Postman client and other resources outside the documentation. So actual task execution was faster. Uh, the mean times participants spent within the documentation were slightly increased for the group with optimized documentation, however, that difference did not reach statistical significance and it would be difficult to interpret anyway because the optimized version contained more text contained additional graphics so it was just simply more information that you could read so to sum up and i think time is almost over um, api documentation should meet the expectations and information needs of software development software developers as described in past research, optimizing API docs by following guidelines derived from research is worth the effort. It has a measurable positive effect on developer performance. It supports more successful initial interactions with the new API. And in particular, it seems to speed up actual task execution. Of course, there are many limitations to our study. It's just a single study and you should be very cautious to derive hard conclusions from a single study that should be kept in mind. Uh, limitations include, for example, the small sample size of just 22 participants and also, of course, the fact that we used a rather simple API for our test. So it's an open question how those findings would generalize to more complex APIs. Um, it should also be kept in mind that we demonstrated a, a joint effect of all the specific modifications which we implemented in response to the guidelines. I think we also need more research that now kind of disentangles the contribution of individual guidelines uh, to the overall joint effect, like the contribution of um, guidelines for selective access to code and things like that. Um, and moreover, knowing about the long-term effects and the impact of individual experience on the success of our guidelines would also be of interest. So. To find out more details on the guidelines, the test procedure, data analysis and results, you can check our paper, um, which appears in the SIGDOC 2020 proceedings. Um, the paper is available in the ACM digital library. It's available open access, so you can download it even if your institution or your company does not subscribe to the ACM digital library. Here's a couple of references that uh, were mentioned in the text and yeah that's it thanks a lot for your attention and your patience